um, also um, talking about potentially her next book as well. So Dr. Emily Grossman is an internationally acclaimed science author, public speaker, and TV personality. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Emily to take it away. Hi there. So lovely to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about this brain fizzing facts. And what, what I'd really love is for everybody who's here, if you're willing to, to turn on your videos. So I'd love for this talk to be really interactive and for us to be able to, to chat um, and for me to be able to ask you questions. So I'm aware that there's, I think there's a, some other people who are want, waiting to join. Um, and I don't see any, I don't see any participants. Uh, production team, can I ask you, can I, so, Jen, can I suggest that we, the participants are now only just joining, so can I suggest no, that? Yes. Can yeah, I we have more that? people coming in now. Okay, so everyone, no. if you are happy to turn on your video, so we are live streaming on YouTube, but we'll only have Emily on YouTube. Um, everyone else will only be seen on the Zoom meeting. So if you'd like to turn on your video so that Emily can interact with you, um, that would be brilliant. Um, and you won't appear on the YouTube video at all. It's just Emily over there. Also, please feel free to put any questions for Emily into the chat as we go through this session. So have we got everyone in from the waiting room now? Uh, and no, yes, Jen. everyone's in. So Jen, would you like to, uh, yeah, um, start us off? That'd be great. <laughs> Sure, thanks to everyone. Sorry for the delay there and getting everyone in. Um, so it looks like everyone has joined now. So thanks again for joining us for this morning session of Cambridge Zero Climate Change Festival. Um, we're really excited to have you here and um, very excited to welcome back Dr. Emily Grossman who helped us to uh, kick off the festival last night with a, a session on um, climate change and this morning doing a session on her book Brain Fizzing Facts, um, which hopefully some of you have read and enjoyed as well. So Dr. Emily Grossman is an internationally acclaimed science author, public speaker, and TV personality. We're very excited that she can join us today and give her time again to, to, to go through um, some of these exciting things with you. So thank you for joining us. And, and, and also just if anyone didn't hear, the session is being streamed on YouTube live, but it's only Emily's video that will show up there. So we welcome you to turn on your video and um, interact with her here on Zoom meeting, but you won't be shown on YouTube at all. It will just be Emily. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over to Emily to start again. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I'd love to be able to see all your videos if you're willing to do that. Don't remember you won't be shown on uh, YouTube, only me will be seen on YouTube. Um, so lovely to see some of you here. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Nice to see some faces that I don't recognize. Nice to see some faces I've heard a lot about but haven't actually met. Hello, the Hardwicks <laughs> over there in Spain, I believe. Uh, hello, the Richards. Um, some of your little ones I haven't met. Nice to see you. Hi again, Andrew. Hi, Kia. Um, lots of people here that I don't know as well. So lovely to see you all. Um, I'd like to start by asking you a question. Who here, anyone here, is ticklish? Anyone here ticklish? 
So if you've got your videos on, put your hand up or give me a wave. Remember, you can also type into the chat box. So if you're willing to ask questions or answer my questions in the chat box, that's really great as well. So anyone here ticklish? Okay, yeah, quite a few of you ticklish. Anyone here like being tickled? Okay, some of you, but mostly tickling is not much fun, right? It's much more fun for the person doing it usually. So did you know that you can block a tickle? Uh-huh. There is something that you can do to stop a tickle from feeling ticklish. Would you like to know what it is? <laughs> yeah, I thought you might. Lots of nodding heads. So, and do please put your uh, microphones on as well. So it'd be nice to be able to hear sort of people making noises and stuff. Um, I'm used to doing these shows in schools where there's like loads of noise and interaction and people putting their hands up and asking questions. So it'd be really nice to have some kind of live interaction. So, oh, great. Thank you for the smiley faces around the screen. The rush force, I think that is. So yes, there is something that you can do to stop a tickle feeling ticklish. But would you like to know the answer? Would yeah. you like to know what that is? Yes, I figured you might. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not going to tell you, and I'm not going to tell you quite yet. And the reason I'm not going to tell you is this. Because the reason I love science is because science is all about asking questions and science is about figuring out the answers. So we, in the whole of this session today, are going to be figuring out the answers between us. Now, science, you see, is about finding stuff out about the world, trying to make sense about the world. And when I was a kid, my favorite word was why. I was constantly asking questions. It was like, what is this, how does things work? What is, why does this happen? What does this mean? I wouldn't accept anything if people couldn't give me an explanation. And this is a great thing because that is what's exciting about the world is finding stuff out. Luckily, people would answer my questions, but mostly I drove my teachers and my parents completely bonkers. Anyone else like asking questions? Yeah. Yeah, great, that's a really good thing. So I grew up wanting to be a scientist, partly because I loved asking questions and finding out about the world, and partly because um, one of the ways I got inspired by science is that um, one of my inspirations was actually my dad. Now my dad is a, a scientist, he's a doctor and a scientist, and when I was really little, my parents got divorced. So I didn't see my dad very often. But when I did see him, I seem to remember we were always going on long car journeys. I don't know why, I don't know where we were going, but I remember long car journeys. And I remember that we would have what he called theory afternoons. And I'm like, okay, all I remember is that these afternoons were times when I would get to hear stories about the world. Now, I didn't know what a theory was. I just knew it was gonna be fun. So for example, one time, he told me that we all used to be monkeys. And I'm like, what? I used to be a monkey? That's crazy. You mean I've got like monkey grandparents? And she, he was like, well, you know, millions of years ago, your great, 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 great grandparents were the same as a monkey. I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> and it was only, I said, can I, do I have monkey cousins? Can I meet them? And it was only many years later at school when I was studying biology that I went, learned that what he was talking about was the theory of, anyone know? Theory of? <laughs> evolution. Yeah, evolution, thank you. Oh, hi, Inocence. Hi, Sophia. My goddaughter, Sophia. Made it <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was the theory of evolution. Oh, we have Fernando from Bolivia joining us as well. That's brilliant. We've got people from all over the world. Um, lots of people still joining. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So that, of course, was the theory of evolution. And then another time I remember him telling me a story that he said that if I was to travel really fast in a spaceship, time would slow down. And I'm like, wow, that is really cool. I want to get in a spaceship. Can I, can I make time go backwards? And he was like, eh, not sure about that, but we can make it go slower. And it wasn't until many years later when I was at school and I was studying A-level physics that I realized that what he was talking about was a different theory. Anyone know what that theory is? Maybe, maybe some of the grown-ups in the room. Yeah, Andrew, you need to put your mic on. Put your mics on, guys, because then it'll be easier. Is that the special theory of relativity? Oh, nice one. Special theory of relativity, <laughs> or sometimes just theory of relativity. Brilliant. And but my favorite story was when my dad told me that he's colorblind and that I'm not. And I'm like, okay you're different to me that, you know, you're a man, I'm a girl. 
and you know I've got long hair you're bald you know there were lots of differences between us <laughs> he's not quite bald but he's not got that much hair um and um I hope he's not listening <laughs> and um so he was like yeah 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 but but what's really interesting he said that you're not colorblind I am but your children one day if you have them might be and I'm like whoa that's kind of cool so you've got something you've given to me and it doesn't show in me at all I don't nobody knows that I've got a colorblind dad but somewhere it's hiding inside of me and if I have babies then they could be colorblind that they could get this like secret thing hidden inside of me from you and he was like uh-huh and I later realized that he was talking about anyone know what these little secret things hidden inside genetics are? Genetics, exactly. And the things hiding that I pass on to my children. So it's the theory of inheritance or genetics. And what are those things that get passed on to, to my kids from my parents that I might not even show? Anyone know what they're called? No. Any adults? So we're talking about genes, genes and DNA. That's what gets passed on from parents to children and to their children. And sometimes we show them and sometimes as in it, it shows in us sometimes it doesn't. So that's what got me really excited about science because it made me realize that science is about asking questions but science is also about stories and it's really relevant and interesting in our lives. And the other thing that got me really excited about science is realizing that actually anybody can be a scientist because there's so many different ways to be a scientist. So some people think, you know, if I asked you to draw a picture of a scientist, what would you draw? Or no, let me, let me phrase that differently. What kind of qualities do you think it takes to be a good scientist? Give me some qualities, some characteristics of a good scientist. Inventive. Inventive, brilliant. So you have to be able to invent things. So perhaps in order to invent things, what might you have to be like? Or some other characters. Oh, curious. Hard working. Hard working, great. So this, remember, this is an important one. It, it's good. So hold on, just let me ask one, answer one at a time, but thanks for all the answers. So it's good to be curious. It's good to want to find out about the world. It's good to work hard, but that doesn't mean you have to be the best. Now that's really important because some people think that to be a scientist, you have to be top of the class. You have to be the absolute best at everything. Not at all. As long as you work hard and try your best, that's what's important. So someone else shouted something out. What, what was it? can be a scientist at any age, it does not matter. Exactly, you can be a scientist at any age. Anyone can be a scientist. So what other qualities do you need? Hardworking, curious, to invent okay. things. What else might help to be a scientist? Open-minded. Really lovely one. That's Manu, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, hi Manu. So yes, uh, being open-minded, being willing to look at things differently. And in a way we could say that's also to do with being creative right? It's to do with being able to look at things from different perspectives, to take in other people's views and opinions, to never being closed to this is the right answer, because sometimes in science there isn't a right answer. Actually to get to the right answer we have to get lots of stuff wrong and again that's one of my favorite things about science is that often people think that science is all about you know doing well, getting things right, um, getting ticks in your exercise book getting the right answer but actually some of the best discoveries in science came about when people got things wrong when people made mistakes can anyone give me a famous example of that of someone who did brilliant stuff in the world of science by actually making a total mistake oh i know i think i can't remember what it was but i was watching a documentary and i've forgotten his name but there was someone who was um who had this piece of fungi and he accidentally mixed it with another one and it made something. Oh, say that again, it made? Um, I can't remember. Penicillin. Penicillin. Oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Excellent, penicillin. excellent, excellent. I've also had a suggestion in the chat box uh, for Edison, yes. So the invention of the light bulb, my goodness, there were so many different types of light bulbs that needed to be tried until they got to the right one. But let's come back to your example, Maya, um, of um, the, and you, do you know what his name is, this this scientist that you're talking about? Um, I can't remember. Can't remember. It can't be Alex. Alexander no. Fleming? Yes, well done. Who said that? No, no. Oh yes, is that? Someone else. Is, somebody else. Somebody else. Felix. Felix, hi Felix. Um, yes, Alexander Fleming. So Alexander Fleming, at the time, nobody had heard of him. He wasn't a particularly famous scientist. He just worked very hard and he was very curious. And he was doing an experiment on bacteria. 
And what he was doing, he was growing some bacteria on what's called a Petri dish, or a little, little sort of round plate covered in food to help the bacteria grow. And he was doing his experiment and he put his uh, Petri dish on his desk in his laboratory and he went on holiday. But he made a mistake. And the mistake he made, anyone know? He, he left the window open. Now, what happens when you put some food on a windowsill, leave the window open and go on holiday? Hope not that we can go very far at the moment because of the pandemic, but apart from the fact that somebody might break in and steal your food, apart from that, what, what happens to the food when you get back? What goes mouldy? It goes mouldy, exactly. And that's usually because some fungus, some like pores of some fungus might have floated in out through the open window and landed on the plate. So you get mouldy bread or mouldy cheese. And so when Fleming got back from his holiday, I think he was on holiday, not terribly sure where he was. Um, when he got back, he picked up his little Petri dish and he noticed that it was covered in mould, covered in fungus. And he was like, oh no, I've ruined my experiment. I'm a terrible scientist. I've got it all wrong. I'm gonna be in total trouble with my boss. But he didn't. He could have thought that, but he actually didn't. What he did is he looked at it again and he went, he said something actually that was one of the most probably one of the most important phrases in science he didn't say eureka i've got it you know, some people think that's one of the most important science phrases in science anyone know who said eureka archimedes archimedes, archimedes when he got in the bath and the water spilled over and he was like ah i understand about displacement of water but no fleming looked at this petri dish covered in fungus thinking he'd ruined his experiment and just before he threw it threw it threw it threw it away he looked at it again and went, oh, that's funny. Now that is an important phrase in science because that is where we get magic, where we go, oh, something really strange happened. Because what he noticed that was funny was that around the fluffy bits of mold on the, on the plate of bacteria, some of the bacteria had died. Now at the time, there wasn't a way that was known to kill bacteria. Now we take it for granted that if we get a bacterial infection, like a throat infection, or we get an infected cut, we can usually quite easily get rid of that. But at the time, people were dying in hospitals all the time because that couldn't happen. So what Fleming realized is there was a chemical in the mold, in the fungus, that could kill bacteria. And he was later, oh, how was he to know the bacteria died? Good question, is that mehack, mehack? Good question, how did he know the bacteria had died? So. Um, bacteria on a plate, a petri dish will look like a kind of grey or pink or yellowy sort of layer um, where you won't be able to see the sort of clear jelly, which is where the food is underneath. And when the bacteria die, you get like a clear ring, like around the fungus, you'd get a clear ring where you could see through to the jelly on the plate and where the bacteria weren't there. Really good questions. That's how he could tell there was like space around the fungus where the bacteria were no longer growing. So you could tell sort of by the colour. So, but, but anyway, so he went on to, with some colleagues, he isolated the chemical from this fungus and he called it, uh, Manu, I think you told us this? Penicillin. Penicillin. And penicillin was the first ever antibiotic and it went on to save millions of lives. So science is about being wrong as much as it's about being right, as long as we have an open mind and we're creative, we use our imagination to try and make sense of what's going on in the world. And finally, a lot of people think, some people think that science is about working hard on your own and sort of sitting in front of your experiments. That is also not necessarily true. Science is just as much about teamwork, about working together, about coming together and sharing your ideas, sharing your um, excitement about the world. And it's also about caring really deeply about the world. You know, to be a scientist, you have to be passionate, you have to be caring, well, you don't have to be, but a lot of scientists are motivated by wanting to understand the world, by wanting to change the world, and wanting to make it a better place. So that's why I love science. So all of this was to kind of bring you into the fact that throughout the rest of this show, what I'm going to be doing, rather than telling you the answers, remember I said that science was about curiosity and imagination and asking why. So I'm going to be asking you to be curious. I'm gonna be asking you to use your imaginations and I'm gonna be asking you to be brave and come up with suggestions and answers that might be wrong. Because remember, it doesn't matter because when we get things wrong, that's just the way we learn, that's the way we progress, progress and that's the way that we get towards the right answer. Oh, you have to be a struggler. 
yeah, I like that idea. That means you have to kind of keep going. You have to be determined. Thank you, uh, uh, Misham, that is in the chat box, I believe. You have to keep going. Some people say resilience. That's a good word as well for a scientist. You have to keep going. Even when things go wrong, you try again and you try again and you keep going. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. These are wonderful answers. So let's get back to the more fun stuff. So I started off by telling you that, did you know, you can block a tickle. So a lot of you seem to want to know the answer to this. And I said, we're going to work it out for ourselves. So can anyone come up with any suggestions, any ideas for how maybe you could block a tickle? Um, aside from, aside from just pushing the other person away and running away. <laughs> I know that. Uh, if you know the answer to any of these, by the way, if you've read my book or, um, and by the way, I'm going to be talking about some of the facts I'm going to be doing are from this book, which is Brain Physics Facts. And I'm going to be doing some that are from my next book, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I'm also going to be doing some that you might not read in any book. So if you do know some of the answers, let somebody else who hasn't read the book or heard it before have a go first. And then maybe I can come to you to give me the explanations. So anyone who doesn't know the answer to this, any suggestions as to how maybe you could block a tickle? Isn't it? Well, one at a time, put your hand up. So Felix, I saw your hand first. Go, go for it, Felix. I know the actual answer. Shall I say it? No, not for now, but thank you. Cara, uh, is that Cara? I don't know if it's Cara with her hand up, but mm -hmm. with the glasses. <laughs> don't you um, do something with your mouth? Or... No. Okay, okay, so that's a nice suggestion. So maybe you could like hold your breath. That could be doing something with your mouth. So that's a good way of like maybe trying to distract ourselves from being tickled. Like, hold our breaths. So that could work. I've actually tried that. Now, normally, if I was doing this at your school or something, I would actually get you to come up and tickle you and get you to hold your breath. I've actually tried this. It doesn't work very well. It blocks it a little bit, but not very well. You can try it later. Okay, so any other suggestions? Uh, who have we got down there? I can't see your name. Maria. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, that's not me. That's my... That's mom. okay. What's your name? Maybe... Uh, I'm Melander. Um, I'm actually, I just forgot what You've I wanted. Forgotten. <laughs> Never mind. Don't worry. We can come back to you. Any other suggestions? I'm going to give you a clue because this is a really tricky one. Oh, Felix, I know you know the answer. Let me come to you in a minute. Um, you can do the explanation for us, okay? Um, so let me give you a clue. Have oh. any of you? Oh, I got someone else with the hand up. Go on then. So another one in Cara's on Cara's screen. Yeah. Um, I think you could like. There's two ways you could do it. You could cross your fingers and hope for the best. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah. Or you could hold. Um, you could close your eyes and that could like you can see it and then you can feel it as much. Great, wonderful suggestions. I love the way your minds are working. This is exactly what science is all about. It's like, oh, what could it be? So let's talk about some of those. And but first, I'll come back to that in a moment. But let me give you a clue first of all, because neither of those are going to quite work, and I'll explain why. Have any of you ever tried to tickle yourself? Yes. Yeah, what happens? Tickle. Tickle. Isn't tickle, right? So, you know, you give it a go now. You look a bit like a monkey. Doesn't work, right? It doesn't tickle. So this is really interesting because this tells us, I know, Felix, I'm going to come to you. <laughs> this tells us that there is something special about when we're tickling ourselves. Now, this is because being ticklish relies on the element of surprise. So actually, your suggestion about closing your eyes would actually make tickle it make make it more ticklish, because if you think about it, back in caveman days, you know, millions of years ago when we were all living in caves, and if there was a surprising feeling on our skin, it was likely to be some kind of creature that might bite us or sting <coughs> us or scratch us. So it was good that we would feel ticklish, because then we would flick it away and get rid of it. And that's why it's good to be ticklish, but imagine what would happen if we felt ticklish every time anything touched our skin, including our own hands. Imagine what would happen every time you put on your shoes and socks. You'd fall about laughing, right? That wouldn't be much good at all. So oh my, the awkward. Yeah. yeah, so a clever part of our brain has evolved, that means changed over time, to be able to block the tickly feelings when it's our own hands on our own skin. And it does this by making a quick prediction about how our hands are going to feel. So that means if we closed our eyes, it would be even more ticklish because we wouldn't be able to predict how somebody else's hands would feel. So how can we use that information to help us try and work out how I could block the tickle coming from someone else, given that if it was my hands, I'd be able to block it. What could I do? 
Uh, yeah, Cara Screen, I don't know your name, um, sorry. I think you could kind of maybe block it with your actual hands, like push him away. Well, you could push them away, but there's something else that you could do with your hands. I'm going to come to you now, Felix, because Let pushing them hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> pushing them away is going to stop them from tickling you, but there's something that you can do even if they are tickling you, even if you can't stop them. Nice. So we've got a suggestion from um, Mayhack, Mihack. Um, and that's absolutely right, but I'm going to let Felix give us the explanation as well, because I did promise him. So Felix, tell us how we can block the tickle. Put your hand on their hand and tickle yourself whilst they tickle me, but then... Oh, you don't actually need to tickle yourself as well. It's simply enough if someone's tickling me. If I put my hands on their hands whilst they're tickling me, and well done, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I'm so sorry, Mech. Um, well done for saying that as well. If I was to put my hands on someone's hands whilst they're tickling me, I wouldn't feel ticklish because my brain is tricked into thinking that their hands are actually my hands. So I know how it's going to feel and I don't feel ticklish. So that to me is one of the most cool things that I've ever learned about the brain and about science. And you can go away and try that, but not now because it will just distract us from the rest of the show. So you can try that after the show. Um, you can also overcome your emotion. That's true. So some of us can overcome our emotions um, mind over matter, but it's sometimes useful to be able to stop the feelings as well. Okay, great. So let's talk about something else. So I'm gonna talk about actually, so that uh, tickling fact was in brain fizzing facts. I'm gonna talk about um, one of my other favorite facts from brain fizzing facts, which is, and again, some of you might have read this one, which is, did you know that there is a creature that can breathe through its bottom? I know it. Oh, oh I know it. again, if you know the answer, or quite a few of you know the answer, great. So I'm going to um, give you multiple choice on this one, and then I'm going to ask those who don't already know the answer, or even those who do, I, I'm going to ask you first, because in the book, you see, I give you, as probably you know, um, uh, four <laughs> options for the answer, and then I get you to figure out, well, I talk you through which ones are not correct as well as which ones are. So I don't just want to know which one is correct. I want to know why the other ones aren't correct. So I'm going to, the four options are a fish, or let's say a puffer fish, a type of fish, um, a type of frog, a type of dolphin, um, or a type of turtle. Um, so even those who know the answer, I would like somebody to explain to me whether it's a fish and if not, why not? Is it a fish and if not, why not? Um, let's have Maya. Uh, I think it is a fish um, because I think um, I heard somewhere that they um, pee through their gills. Oh, OK. So gills are absolutely right, but it's not their bottom. Oh, yeah. So they use their gills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use their gills for breathing. Well, let's say it's not actually, strictly speaking, breathing, but it's absorbing oxygen from the water through the flaps of their gills into their bodies. And then that oxygen is used for a process called respiration, which is how they get energy, which is how all living creatures, well, most living creatures get energy. So, all right. So it's not a fish. They do use, they don't breathe through their mouths, but they certainly don't use their bottom. <laughs> they use their gills. So well done, Maya. Okay, so is it a dolphin? And if not, why not? Anyone? Uh, okay, Felix. It's not a dolphin. It's not a dolphin. Well done. Why is it not a dolphin? How do dolphins breathe? Um, they breathe through their nose. Through their? Like, the thing on the top of their head. Yeah, it's called a blowhole. So dolphins don't breathe through their mouths. They have mouths. But when they need to get oxygen, they don't have to put their mouth above the water. They just have to put the top of their head above the water. And then they suck in all the air, not all the air, some air from above the water. And they take it into their lungs. And then they use the oxygen from that air. And then when they're done with that air, they blow it back out through the hole in the top of their head. And with it comes any bits of yucky water that have got tangled up in their lungs. And it comes out as a sort of turbocharged snot right up out of their blowhole. So I wouldn't go anywhere near a dolphin when it's doing that because it comes out very, very fast and it's pretty revolting. So dolphins breathe in a strange way, but not through their bottom. Okay, um, anyone think it's a frog or if not, why not? 
Um, okay, so this is Kara's Car computer. One or other. Of I think it's a frog because I think I remember saying it in assembly, and I think I might have got it right. It's okay, a... and the, the what the person sitting next to you? You also had your hand up. I think. I think. I think it could be a turtle because... Um, oh, hold on, let's come back to turtles. Okay, so let's deal with frogs for just a second. I also think it's um, the frog because it, it's like, I remember seeing this, I think it's the most unusual and like you never expect the most unusual. So always guess um, outside the box and like... That's so such a great answer. Thank you. And you're right. Often the most unusual things are the right answers in science. And that's again, something that I think is really wonderful about science. So yes, it would be unusual for it to be a frog, but actually it's not a frog. Now frogs do breathe in a strange way, when they're on land, they breathe just like most mammals. They're not mammals, they're amphibians, but they breathe through their mouth, they take the air into their lungs, and then they breathe the air back out. But when they're in water, they're able to breathe in a very strange way, but not through their bottom. They actually breathe using their skin. It's like their skin is one big gill, and the skin is coated in water, that's why they're slimy, and they absorb the oxygen from the water through their skin into their body. So frogs are unusual, but they're not bottom breathers. So that leaves us with, and yes, Maria's computer, I can't remember your name, was it Miranda? Millie. Millie, it, Millie, go on then. It's definitely turtles, they do, yes, they do do that, I know because I, well, it's kind of a long explanation, but I am certain it is turtles. You are certainly right, well done, Millie. Can you remember why or how? I didn't actually even learn why I okay. just found it in just this place. I play I play a game called Animal Jam and on the loading oh. screen they sometimes give you random facts but That's great. explanation. Thank but you that, really. So yeah, so it's it's great um to know random facts. And I think it's all even more exciting sometimes when we try and figure out why, because it's so weird. Okay, so we've got a brilliant answer um from Mehak again, I'm sorry if I've got your name wrong. Um, turtle, oh, wow, Mishan, some really good answer there as well. So Mehak says, turtles breathe from bottoms because they absorb oxygen from their bottom. They breathe through their bottoms and it's called cloacal respiration. And the same from Mishan, well done you two. Either you've read this somewhere or you've worked it out or you've read my book, but that's absolutely brilliant explanation. Doesn't matter where you get the information from, it's really great to be able to explain it and put it in your own words, so well done. So yes, the fact is that there are certain types of turtle that they get so cold because they live in really cold areas that when they hibernate, rather than hibernating on the land, they actually hibernate mm -hmm. under the surface of a frozen lake because the water stays warmer under the, under the lake than it does on the land. And so whilst they're underwater, they can't breathe through their mouth anymore. So instead of, they can't breathe through their skin because what have they got over their skin? Big fat shell. So instead they have to breathe through their bottom. So they suck in water through a hole in their, hole in their bottom called the cloaca. Then they absorb the oxygen through the walls of the hole in their bottom, kind of like a fish's gill again. And then they scoosh the water back out again. And they do this every second, Ch -ch 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 -ch. water in and out the whole time they are hibernating, which means they can hibernate for a long period of time and they can get energy from that oxygen. Um, well, using that oxygen in the water. So that is a turtle and, the, and the, one of the reasons that I love and a lot of the facts in my book and my books are all about kind of the an animal kingdom is because I think it's so important that we realize that animals and wildlife, they're not just pretty, they're not just lovely things to look at in a zoo or on a nature program, but actually they're very, very important. And they're very important to us as humans because we rely on animals. So can anyone give me some examples of the ways in which we rely on the natural world, on plants and animals, and why therefore we need to really protect the natural world. Because as some of you might know, the natural world is, you know, some creatures are really in danger right now, that we, we're losing um, some numbers of certain animals and, and creatures, and we, need, we really need to be looking after them on our planet and protecting us, mm -hmm. them. So why do we need to, apart from the fact that they deserve to live, for, as a human perspective, why do we need to look after all the creatures on this planet, not just ourselves? Um, so let's have, again, Kara's computer, but- um, um, I think- Wait, no, 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 the, um, you're the friend sitting next to you. 
Um, I think that um, we should protect all of them because if one dies, then um, the food chain, because it's in the food chain, all the other ones will die because um, it might the poo might create food for other animals or another animal might be a that brilliant great explanation so we need to look after the natural world because everything is linked so ecosystems food chains food Sorry. webs you might have heard of these phrases this shows us that one animal if it impacts another animal impacts another animal so even just the smallest animal if we damage those or if too many of those die out then everything could sort of get impacted and come tumbling down so you know we really need to be careful with them um Ada's made a lovely point here to say that we are we are from the natural world ourselves that's absolutely true what a beautiful thing to say thanks Ada that we're all connected we're all linked um Maya yes what would you um, like to say about that there's a jungle beetle in Borneo and uh if it wasn't there if it was dead then um in Borneo everyone would be knee deep in poo Wow, I did not know that fact. That's such a brilliant fact. So yeah, this sounds like these dung beetles are very good at like disposing of poo and cleaning up the world for us. And there are many insects and the creatures that help to clean up our planet. So the more we get rid of them and pollute our planet ourselves, then the more of a dirty and unpleasant planet we're going to have to live on. So any other examples of creatures that we depend on? Um, yeah, Kara's screen again on the right this time. Um I think bees, because people might be scared of bees, like myself used to be, because they sting you, but they're really not harmless at all. The bigger they are, they're not as harmless, and they're quite cute. They pollinate like food for us. Like, Brilliant. What a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you're right. Some people have even said that bees could be one of the most important creatures on our planet, because... Not only are they sweet and pretty to look at, and uh, of course they can sting you, but also, as you said, they pollinate our crops. So the crops that we rely on to eat, that grow in this country or the country where you're living, that also grow in other parts of the world and get imported to where you are living and we are living, most of those rely on healthy soil and rely on pollination from insects in order to grow. Now, both soil and the insects themselves require require living creatures. So insects are crucial for us being able to feed ourselves on this planet, which is why a lot of people are really worried at the moment that insects are kind of dying, we're losing the numbers of insects, which is why there's a lot of good work going on on the planet, such as rewilding programs and ways to conserve wildlife that are helping to look after the bees and helping to look after other insects. I also mentioned the soil. So we need living creatures in the soil to help to, to keep the soil nice and fertile, nice and healthy, in order to be able to grow nutritious crops for us to eat. And one of the most important creatures in the soil are actually earthworms, yeah. because they help us to grow really good food. So we really rely on all of these creatures. Um, Oh, you have a beehive in your garden, Ada. That's wonderful. And uh, Mihak um, has said we rely on, oh, sorry, Misham has said we rely on everything um, in nature, medicine, water, materials, shelter. Yeah, wonderful list. We rely on trees um, to, to um, other, so Mihak has said forests are the lungs of the world. That's absolutely right. They absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they give out oxygen, which is what we need in order to survive. Absolutely brilliant, really wonderful answers. Misham says it's a wonder, nature is a wonder that inspires us and underpins our ecosystem. Absolutely. So yeah, wonderful answers here. And I just wanna tell you one story about how nature is all linked, just to really, to really bring home the fact that we all rely, everything relies on everything else. So there was a, um, a really interesting story that happened about hundred years ago um, in a national park in America called Yellowstone National Park, where some of the farmers um, ha, were starting to convert some of the wild land to growing uh, and grazing uh, livestock like cows and sheep. Oh, by the way, speaking of which, does anyone know why people are worried that there's so many cows on the planet now? And some people are saying that it's good that we try to cut down a bit on how many cows there are and how much um, beef and lamb that we eat because of, anyone know why, why that's a, a problem uh, or challenge? Uh, one of the Hardwicks, I think you had your hand up. Did you have your hand up? No, I think I no, okay. Uh, uh, Millie, go for it, Millie. Oh, well, 
actually, I think the cows, don't they make, um, what's that? Um, cows make, um, yes. oh no, I forgot, my mum, what? Yeah, you, I heard it, Millie, it begins with an M, you're nearly there. Me oh. E oh, my oh, mum someone... forget exactly what I was going to say, I forget the second <laughs> oh. time. Oh. I do as well. That happens to be Millie all the time. Yeah. I'm about to say something and then I forget it. It's so annoying, isn't it? Don't worry. I know that you know it. It's in your brain somewhere. Uh, Felix, do you want to tell us? Then. Say again? Cows fart methane. They do. Cows fart and burp methane. And methane is one of the challenging things on our planet. And I'm going to come back to that why in a moment. But I'm just going to finish the story about Yellowstone Park. And then I'm going to come back to methane. And we're going to talk about why methane is, is something that is actually really not very good for our planet. So in Yellowstone National, National Park, the farmers were clearing away some of the land so they could farm more uh, sheep and cows, which is actually something really we should be doing less of, not more of. But anyway, this was 100 years ago. Um, and in order to do that, um, what they realised was that, that wolves were coming in and the wolves were coming in and attacking the cattle the cows so the farmers uh, came in and they got some hunters and they said okay please go and shoot all the wolves that sounds a bit mean but they were thinking you know we need to look after our our livestock so the wolves died but then what happened so what happened next was that there were some um big kind of elk in the forest in the wild land that usually were hunted on by the um by the wolves. So those started to increase in number. So then there were far more elk because they weren't hunted by the wolves. And then because there were more elk, they started eating more of the young trees. So then there were fewer of the sorts of, of trees. That meant that um, some of the trees that were hanging over the banks of the river to shade the river fell away, which meant that they, the rivers got warmer because they weren't shaded by the sun, which meant that the, the, some of the fish started to die. And then because the young trees weren't there anymore, that meant that the beavers couldn't make um, their dams, which they used the young trees for, to block the river, and they didn't have any homes. So then they couldn't carry on living in the area. And also some of the songbirds that lived in the trees, they didn't have anywhere to live anymore, so they had to fly away. So very quickly, just from killing the wolves, you had a knock-on effect on the elk, on the beavers, on the fish, and on the birds. And it was only when the luckily humans realized this and they said, gosh, we need to reintroduce the wolves to the area. They got the wolves back in and then things started eventually to come back into balance. So what we learned from this is that sometimes without realizing it, humans make mistakes that damage, um, the, that damage the wildlife on our planet, but actually it's never too late that we can change our ways, which is what we're trying to do now. We're trying to look after our planet more. We're trying to um, put in lots of schemes that help to look after wildlife. And there's lots of ways you can get involved in that. You can ask your parents, you can ask your teachers. Maybe you've got an eco council at school. Like I think um, Nikki's just told me, that's Myra and Felix's mum. So there's lots of ways that you can protect wildlife. So let's come back um, to in a sort of roundabout way, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about, uh, well, I'm gonna ask you what you know about methane in a minute, but in order to get here, I want to give you one more really weird fact, but I'm noticing that uh, on Cara's computer that we've got someone else with their hand up. So do you want to ask your question? There's one for the methane thing, and, and there's another story um, that in America, there was um, suddenly, um, I think it was a long time ago, there was a swarm of ladybirds and they kept on eating their crops or oranges and then they had to burn the trees which um, produced more CO2 and less oxygen but um, I think that methane is a part of carbon dioxide. Great, lovely story. Thank you for that and yeah methane is, is, is definitely related to carbon dioxide. We're going to talk about um, how no, that finally remember what mum was never mind never mind I'll be oh, okay interested. don't worry well I tell you what because we're sort of everyone's really keen to talk about this let's talk about it now so tell me can anyone tell me um what is the problem with both methane and carbon dioxide we've sort of mentioned it a bit already but can anyone tell me why we ought to be really be trying to reduce 
cut down how much methane and carbon dioxide we're putting out into our atmosphere by farming less cows, by looking after the soil, um, and by not cutting down so many trees because they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So can anyone tell me what methane and carbon dioxide do and why it is that they're a problem? Um, okay. Felix, go for it. Uh, oh. oh, go for it, Felix. It makes holes in the ozone layer. Ooh, not quite. So the ozone layer is actually something a little bit different. So let, let's just, um, let me just tell you what the ozone layer is. So the ozone layer is often, you know, it's very easy to confuse the ozone layer and carbon dioxide and the impact that has. Because the ozone layer is kind of like a parasol, like a sunshade that goes around the earth. It's like somebody standing on the earth and holding up a big umbrella and protecting us from the most intense rays from the sun, the ultraviolet rays from the sun. So this is a very good thing, this ozone layer. Problem is, back in the 1970s, we started using lots of, well, we were using lots of chemicals like spray deodorants and sprays that, would, uh, that were actually making holes in the ozone layer. So what's ended up happening was that this sunshade protecting us actually has some little holes in it, particularly a big one over Australia. Um, and what that meant was that too many of the damaging rays of the sun were able to get through. And that means that we're more likely to get things like skin cancer or um, ultraviolet um, sunburn and, and damage from the rays of the sun. But luckily, scientists noticed this, scientists worked it out and the whole world came together to ban what's called CFCs. Those were the chemicals that made the holes in the ozone layer. And now about 40, 30, 40 years later, I think this is, sorry, this was in the 1980s, not the 70s, um, uh, early 90s. And now it's, it's very, very much repaired. It's not totally better, but we've done a lot of good by stopping it. So this actually, um, it causes, yeah, Misham says, it causes nausea, vomiting, headache, facial flushes. Yeah, that's absolutely. So that's the reason we want to, uh, oh, which, so you're talking about methane now? Hold on, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about there. So perhaps you can clarify. So no, ozone itself is this, um, sunshade, uh, the holes in it meant that we were getting too much ultraviolet damage from the sun, but now we've largely repaired that. And this is a great example of how when humans come together, we can pass laws and we can take action to protect the planet and to protect people living on the planet. So the ozone layer is a great example here of what can be done to make things better on the planet. However, when it comes to carbon dioxide and methane, there's a lot more that needs to be done because this is a different process. So can anyone explain what carbon dioxide and methane do that's bad for the planet? Um, yes, Cara, Cara's computer. They produce um, something called global warming and that affects the climate. I've got two things to say. The Arctic is um, getting melted and the polar bears are losing their homes, so they're penguins, because they live on the ice and it's cracking and sometimes it's really sad because they get separated by their family. And also produces, um, as cars drive and cows fart produce, like um, cows produce oh, yeah. methane and it goes into the air and it creates a big blanket and it gets thicker and warmer and it's quite bad for the environment and climate so yeah that's so, what's your name what's your name um eleni eleni that's such a brilliant explanation I, I felt really like touched by you talking about the polar bears and the penguins thank you so let's let's sort of pick this apart a little bit so you're absolutely right so what you said here is that carbon dioxide and methane um both cause or um what's known as global warming so let's talk about that a little bit, exactly. So um, is that uh, Felix who wrote greenhouse gas? Yes, exactly, great phrase. So carbon dioxide and methane are both greenhouse gases. Now what that means is that um, we have a layer around the earth, so different to the ozone layer, remember the ozone layer is a sunshade, we have another layer of gases called greenhouse gases um, and they form like a or it's almost like a warm fluffy blanket around the earth rather than the sunshade. So this is like a nice fluffy blanket. And without this fluffy blanket, none of us would be here. We need it. You know, people often think, oh, greenhouse gases, they're bad things. They're not bad things at all. We need this fluffy blanket. Without it, we'd be so cold we couldn't survive at night because this fluffy blanket traps the heat in the earth's atmosphere and keeps it in so we keep nice and warm. However, our fluffy blanket is getting thicker and that isn't good. 
And that's because of the extra greenhouse gases that humans have been putting into the atmosphere, not the ones that should be there naturally, but extra amounts. And we're talking extra methane. We already talked about that from the cow burps and farts. Methane is also produced by, in paddy fields where they grow rice. So um, we're also talking carbon dioxide. So anyone know why there's tons of extra carbon dioxide in our atmosphere due to humans? What is it that produces huge amounts of carbon dioxide? Apart from cutting down trees, we already talked about cutting down trees. So when we cut down trees, we don't pull in as much carbon dioxide. And when we burn them, we release even more carbon dioxide. So that's definitely a bad thing. But what else releases carbon dioxide? Um, like... uh, sorry, uh, 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 Maya. Oh, I can't hear you, Maya. I think you want me to start again. Is it things that are um, things that have fuel and um, so like cars and like yeah. stuff like that? Brilliant. It's anything that uses fossil fuels. So fossil fuels are things like coal and oil and gas that were formed millions of years ago under the seas and under rocks from dead sea creatures and dead plants. And they contain a lot of carbon. And when we burn those fossil fuels, such as petrol, yep, yeah, that's right. Um, when we burn those fossil fuels, we release a lot of energy. Now, energy is a good thing. We need energy, which is why we've been burning fossil fuels to release energy in factories. Petrol is a fossil fuel in cars to release energy and in aeroplanes and in trains. Um, not so much in trains these days, thankfully. Um, but when we burn fossil fuels, we release energy. However, we also release carbon dioxide from the carbon that was trapped in the fuels. And that carbon dioxide adds to our fluffy blanket. In addition, we release carbon dioxide when we churn up the soil. So when we're doing what's called big agriculture or big farming, and they're constantly plowing up the soil, there's lots of carbon trapped in the soil that is released into the atmosphere. So lots of things that humans are doing release extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And now that we know that that's happening, we really need to stop it. We really need to stop there being all this extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because as you rightly said, Eleni, the, the extra methane, the extra carbon dioxide, they make our blanket thicker. That means the earth gets warmer. That means that causes what's called global warming. And global warming has an impact on our climate. So it causes, for example, heat waves, um, or at least it makes them more likely to happen. Um, it means that the atmosphere gets hotter, so some areas get really, really hot and you have long heat waves, which might feel nice in some countries, but in some countries that's very damaging. Also, it means that we get more water evaporating from the oceans, and that forms water vapour in the atmosphere, which forms more clouds, which means we get more rain. And when we get more rain, we might get floods, we also, when there's more rain, we might get storms and we might get people's homes being damaged and that's already happening in lots of parts of the world. Um, and when we get heat waves, also sometimes the water dries out. It's very dry and the soil can get dry, which means we might get droughts and there's people in parts of the world who don't have enough to drink. And this is something that we really need to start to be much more careful about because also when it gets very dry that can cause the land to more easily catch fire and we can get like things like forest fires. So these are things that are already happening in parts of the world. Um, oh Lolly and Fury are saying hello to you on YouTube. Oh hi they say hi I'm Nick's Phoenix. Okay thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah we really need to be um, very mindful that we make better decisions in order to not uh, release any more carbon dioxide and methane than we need to. Another greenhouse gas is called nitrous oxide. That's something that's released um, what, using fertilizer in certain types of like farming. So that's why often people are talking about how we need to transform and change the way we farm food so that we're better to the environment. So all of these things are things that we really need to be looking at. So can anyone tell me, um, how you know what kind of decisions we could be making what kind of better decisions we could make, be making in order to look after our planet and to stop our greenhouse gases our greenhouse fluffy blanket getting even thicker and then before i go i'm going to tell you how we could be making better decisions um so uh sophia i haven't heard from you sophia not going to airplane not going to car 
Great. So if at all possible to take our holidays instead of going by aeroplane, I know we can't fly anywhere anyway at the moment because of lockdown for most of us. But when we do go on holiday, rather than going by plane, we could go by train, particularly electric trains, because they're much better for the environment because we still need energy. But we can produce energy using other ways, not fossil fuels. So some electricity these days comes from renewable energy, green energy, like wind, like solar power, like hydroelectric dams, um, uh, like many other ways. So we don't need to be using fossil fuels. So great, aeroplanes at the moment only use fossil fuels, even the ones that are called carbon offsetting, most of those don't actually really do very much. So really we should try and stop flying if we can. Um, only go in the car a little bit, nice one Ada, yeah. So use our car as little as possible, try to walk or cycle or go, or go by public transport, that's a much better idea. If you do need to go by car, if at all possible, you could maybe think about switching to an electric car instead, because in the future those are going to be using much more forms of renewable energy instead. Any other things, any other better decisions we could make? Uh, using buses or public transport, thank you, Mihak, instead of our own individual vehicles. Exactly, because then there'll be fewer vehicles on the road. Well done, yeah, nice one. Any other better decisions we could make? Um, uh, Lily, was it Lily? Millie, Millie, sorry, Millie. Actually, um, this, actually isn't, aren't the, don't the buses need more power to carry lots more people? Than That's a really good question. So yes, sometimes they do need more power, but the thing is, think how close people sit in a bus. Obviously at the moment, we can't sit very close to each other on a bus, but think how close people sit together on a bus. So in one bus, it maybe takes up maybe the space of three cars, but it's got, usually in three cars, you'd only have like maybe three people or maybe six people at the most. So in a bus, you've got more than six people, right? So it's just a more efficient way of, of carrying people. Efficient means you're kind of, uh, doing the same job, but sort of using less energy, using less space. Um, and also more and more buses are running on electric, which means that they can use renewable energy or green energy rather than fossil fuels. Ah, oh, Felix, good point. Another one, eat less meat. Yeah. So it's a very personal choice about eating meat because obviously we need to make sure we get enough protein and we look after our bodies. So, so if you're not going to eat meat, it's important to eat lots of beans and um, uh, lentils and peas and stuff like that. But one good thing we can do is certainly cut down on the amount of meat that we eat, because as we've said before, um, farming meat involves uh, plowing the land, which releases lots of carbon dioxide. And also the manure from cows and sheep releases another greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. The fertilizer needed for the land releases nitrous oxide. And of course, the burps and farts release methane. So eating less meat is a really good thing that you can do. Um, so any other suggestions? And then I'm just, I'm just over, going to overrun by about five, 10 minutes because we did start five to 10 minutes late. So if anyone needs to go bang on the hour, I do understand, um, but it took a little while for people to come into the call. So I'm just gonna go for another five to 10 minutes. So do stay if you can. Um, so yes, Cara's screen, both of you got your hand up. Is it me or my brother? So let's go for your brother first and then you speak next. Thank um, you. It's kind of, um, well, I've kind of got one that joins yeah. into the other. So basically, um, that did you know from the last ice age there um, that the water level has risen 130 metres because of um, global warming? But if everyone painted their roof, roofs white, um, it could, um, because the, um, actually um, the ice reflects the heat back. So maybe our roofs could do that if we paint them white. Great, really good thinking there. So yeah, let's talk about ice for a second because we mentioned how the extra heat in the atmosphere causes changes to our weather, causes it hot areas get hotter, drier, hot, hot dry areas get hotter and drier, uh, wet areas get wetter. So we talked about that, but also the extra heat in the atmosphere causes ice to melt. And we, I know that um, Eleni mentioned that as well. Um, so yes, when the ice melts, not only is there no places for creatures like polar bears to hunt for their seals, but also when ice melts, the ice, the, the water from that was trapped in the ice, if it's land ice, like in Greenland and Antarctica and in glaciers, that ice, as it melts, the water runs off into the sea and it causes the sea levels to go up. And that's something that's very concerning because there are parts of the world that if we don't make changes quite 
quickly. There's parts of the world where they might get flooded and people might have to leave their homes. And the other reason that sea levels go up is because when water gets hotter because of the extra heat in the atmosphere, it actually expands. Hot water takes up more space than cold water. So that's another reason why sea levels are rising, the melting ice and because they take up more space. So that's another reason why we need to be very careful with what we're doing to the planet now. So yeah, absolutely right. Thank you for that. Um, Eleni, you wanted to say something um, else? I would like to say that um, there's one more thing that I think we might have said it or we might not, but um, like we have a local shop and what we do to help it is walk there and get our shopping or um, to help reduce cars if you're going on long really? journeys, you could um, maybe have an electric car because those are better for the environment because right. they just um, fumes into the air and fumes like petrol and gases are bad. Great, lovely. So I'm going to move on for a second, Maya, because I just want to, to we were, we've been talking a lot about making good decisions, okay. making better decisions about how we live our lives. Um, and I'd like to just tell you one of my favourite facts. It's actually going to be in book two. So book two is called, I'm going to show you the picture of the front cover. It's not out yet, but you can pre-order it already on um, online bookshops and stuff. It's out in May. But um, I decided to dedicate a lot in book two to things to do with climate and the natural world. It's still the same format as book one, lots of fun facts, definitely weird facts about we and poo as well, because I got slightly obsessed with writing about facts about poo in book two, sorry about this. Um, but that's what it looks like. And that's gonna be out in May, but you can pre-order it now if you go online. Um, so one of my favorite facts from book two is related to this topic, which is that, there's a way in which we can make better decisions. Now, of course, that could include decisions about protecting the planet. So did you know that we make better decisions when we need a we? How crazy is that? We make better decisions when we need a we. Now, there are scientists who have studied making decisions and needing a we, and they have realized that when people need a we, they're better they're more likely to make a decision with a good long-term outcome rather than something they just want right now. So for example, they said to people, would you like a bar of chocolate? Or if you can wait till tomorrow, I'll give you 10 pounds instead. Now, obviously waiting till tomorrow is a better decision, just like doing things to protect the planet rather than things we feel like doing right now just for our own good is a better decision. But why is it that people make those better decisions when they need a wee? Well, scientists think that what's going on is that when we need a wee, the part of our brain that's responsible for controlling that physical urge to just let it all out and wee on the floor, kicks into overdrive and works really hard to stop us from weeing. We don't know it's happening. It happens unconsciously. However, that same part of our brain is also responsible for controlling our emotional urges, like the urge to have that chocolate or the urge to buy something else in the shops you don't really need, like another rabbit or a trampoline or something you don't actually need. And why would it be a better decision to not buy things that you don't actually need related to what we've been talking about? Uh, Felix? more plastic and everything else to be used. More. Brilliant. So first of all, the more we buy, the more we use plastic, the more that plastic ends up in the seas. Even if we recycle plastic, a lot of that still ends up in the seas. So it's much better to not buy it in the first place. Also, what else do we protect by not buying so much stuff? Not just plastic, but what else? What about buying things like more computer games or digital equipment or clothes? Why is it good to not buy so many of those? Eleni? I think it's better because is it I don't know but is it electricity something to do great it is it's not just electricity but it's energy it's power because to make anything requires factories requires power exactly Felix well done factories okay. um, and I'll come back to you on Misham on that one because that's a great um, information I'm going to share that in just a minute I'll come back to you but um, yes to make anything requires energy and that requires factories also once things are made be it a computer or a phone or a toy or a, a new pair of jeans or some trainers whenever they're made often they get made in factories abroad which then have to get flown or shipped to this country factories boats uh, planes lorries 
burn fossil fuels. So the more that we can stop ourselves from needing to buy lots of new things that we don't actually need, of course, if we need stuff, fine. The more that we can, as Michem puts it, reduce, reuse and recycle, the better we can protect the planet. So I'm just gonna finish with a final demonstration. So we've talked and finishing in about one minute for everybody who um, wants to time check on this. So I'm just gonna finish by wanting to show you something. So we talked about um, how extra heat in the atmosphere not only causes um, things to get hotter, but also causes places, some places to get wetter. And we said that that's because the heat causes water from the oceans to evaporate and to form water vapor, which is invisible in the sky. There's water vapor everywhere, all around us, but there's particularly lots above the oceans because it's evaporated. That water vapor, thank you, Andrew. Yes, yes, all around you in the room. Um, I can see you. So um, that water vapor, then eventually, when it gets cool enough, either by rising up where it gets colder in the atmosphere or because the atmosphere just gets colder, that water vapor then comes together and condenses to form tiny little water droplets that come together to form a cloud. And when it gets even colder or higher, those clouds then, the droplets come even closer together and they fall as rain which is why I said before that the more heat in the atmosphere, the more clouds and the more rain in areas that are already quite cloudy and rainy. So I'm just gonna finally show you something magic that can demonstrate that process. So given that I told you that there is invisible water vapor all around us, that there's some in this room, that means there is even some in this empty plastic bottle. Now, before anybody pulls me up on this, this is reusable. I use this for every time I do this experiment and I will not throw it away. <laughs> so that's important that we don't keep blind plastic bottles, but this is just one. Um, so given that there is invisible water vapor in this plastic bottle, which is empty, if I can make this the air inside this plastic bottle get a little bit colder, just like it does when it rises up through the atmosphere above the oceans. We can't. Do you think I could make something magic happen? Now, yes. as you said, somebody said we can't. I'm not sure if you were talking to me, but actually, no, I can't just make it get colder. But what I could do is make it get colder by using something called pressure differences. Now, this is a bicycle pump. If any of you have ever pumped up a bicycle tire or a car tire, you will notice that when you pump air into it, the pressure builds up, it gets really hard. And actually, if you really sensitively touch it, you will notice it gets a little bit hotter because when pressure increases, things get hotter which means that when pressure decreases, when air rushes out of something, it should get colder. So using this idea, and this is quite ambitious because usually I have an assistant to help me with this. So if I was uh, coming to your school, for example, I'd get one of you to help me, but unfortunately I can't. Um, I take a cork, I put it in the end of this plastic bottle. The cork I have made a little hole through using a screwdriver and I've attached it to the end of the nozzle that goes on the end of the bicycle pump. I'm gonna pump air into this bottle to make the pressure go up. Hopefully the temperature will go up a little bit, it'll get a bit warmer. Then I'm going to let the air out very suddenly if I've got enough hands and all going well, it should get colder and the invisible water vapor should condense and we should see something totally magic happen. So wish me luck because I don't have very many hands to do this on my own, but I'm gonna pump the air in first of all, I'm still here. I'm pumping the air in, I'm holding onto it tight. It's getting filled up with air. I can feel it expanding. I can feel the pressure building up on my knee. If I touched it, it would feel a little bit warmer. There's water in. Uh, there's a tiny little, um, I'll tell you what's in the bottom, is that to help this along, there's a tiny, dro a few drops of surgical spirit in the bottom of the bottle, which helps the water vapor to condense it. actually also make some alcohol vapor condense. So that's a little trick to make sure it happens first time when I'm doing it with you guys. Okay, so I've filled it right up. So keep an eye on it. I'm about to let go of, I'm about to let the air out of it. Three, two, one. That is a cloud in a bottle. Cool, hey? So, <laughs> thanks everyone. So those have been some of my favorite brain fizzing facts and some of my favorite world whizzing facts from the book that's coming out in May, which I said you can pre-order now. Um, thank so you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh. Thanks, Millie. That's so thank you. Oh, thank you, Felix, for uh, showing a copy, um, modeling, modeling my book and your signed copy. Yes. So Sophia, uh, Felix is Sophia's big brother. Sophia is my goddaughter. So I signed a copy for them all. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, everyone who's been live streaming on the YouTube channel. 
Thank you to everybody who's watching it now on playback. Um, thank you to, particularly to all the young people who've been on the call with us and who've been answering and asking questions. Um, those who've been on the screen, those who've had their videos off because might not have been um, wanted uh, for others to see you. You're all welcome. And remember, science is fun. Science is exciting. Science is about discovering things about the world. Science yeah. is that you can look after and protect the world. And anyone can be a scientist, no matter who you are, no matter what you're like. Science is about imagination, creativity, solving problems, being curious, working with people and looking after the planet. And I've just got one time for one last question from Maya, who's got their hand up, who's had their hand up for ages. Thanks, Maya. Go for it. Um, well, I've got a question. Do yeah. you, um, you know the underwater volcanoes in the sea? <laughs> Not um, very much about them, but I'll, I, I know of them. Do you know if they contribute to climate change? That's a very good question. So underwater volcanoes. So volcanoes do contribute, um, they do let out heat um, in terms of volcanoes on the land, they let out heat, um, but it's been shown that the heat from volcanoes is, is very, very tiny compared to heat from climate change and from greenhouse gases and uh, carbon dioxide and methane. So those are the ones on the land. The ones in the sea, again, um, I imagine that the heat that comes out of those is pretty small compared to the heat that we're putting into the oceans from um, the extra greenhouse gases that are causing the atmosphere and the oceans to heat up and damage lots of fish and, and creatures living in the oceans. Um, there may be other gases that also come out of uh, volcanoes underwater, but I'm not sure about those. But it's a very good question and definitely something that I will go away and find out about and look up and I would invite you to also um, look into that yourselves. Um, so I do think we have to finish up because I know there's another session going to be happening quite soon. Um, Jen has just told us all. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you so much, Dr. Grossman. This has been absolutely fascinating. We really appreciate you sharing your time today. And the experiment was so cool, too. And well done for doing that on your own. <laughs> <laughs> it was a risk. It was a risk. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. We really, really appreciate you giving your time. And hopefully you've all had a great time and learned some fun facts as well. And um, so just to say if anyone wants oh, yeah. to get in touch or wants to find out more about me, um, um, you can get in touch with me through my website, which is just emilygrossman.co.uk. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. So at Dr. Emily Grossman on Twitter, at Dr. Emily Grossman one on Instagram. Um, and if you enjoyed it, please do post about it on social media and, and let people know that that um, that you had a good time, uh, especially because I get lots of haters talking about climate change. So it's nice to have some nice people saying nice stuff. Um, and yes, back to Jen. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Brilliant. Yes, definitely. Be sure to do that. Um, and also, please do check out other sessions for our Climate Change Festival happening over the next week. There's lots of family events today and tomorrow, especially in some after school things too. Um, the next session at there's one, a session at 11 a.m. Well, it's already started now. Um, or there's one at 4 p.m. today, which is um, a cooking with biofuels masterclass where you can learn about um, cooking with green ingredients and biofuels. And it is a family friendly yeah. um, sort of session as well. So I hope you'll check that out. And thank you all again for joining. And thank you so much again, Dr. Grossman as well. Take Bye care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.